have you got an amazing product or service that really helps people? Awesome. I'm so happy you found the Marketing Bytes podcast. My name's Oliver Denyer, and I'm going to teach you how to build your audience, position yourself as an expert, and create a massive amount of impact using time-tested marketing strategies that translate to the online world. Would you like to build a business you can grow without hustling your face off? Would you like to know how to get consistent results from your advertising campaigns and get customers for free? Astonish people with your content? Build an email list of hungry prospects that hang on to your every word? Well, if this is what you're looking for, then you've come to the right place. Expect value bomb after value bomb, because I deliver my podcast with the Marketing Bytes promise. By the end of each episode, I guarantee you'll get an aha moment that was worth paying for. Hey, what's up? It's Ollie here. So today I've got possibly uh, the biggest guest I've ever had on the Marketing Bytes podcast and possibly the biggest guest I'm going to have for a very long time. Now, I've been following Frank Kern uh, for about eight years and the reason I'm so excited about having him on my podcast is because he was really the person who opened my eyes to the online marketing world. Right? He was kind of the one who gave me the first contact with building an online business, the possibilities you could have with it. And I think I've been following him longer than any of the other sort of online marketing experts. Now, at this point, you probably already know who Frank Kern is. I'd be willing to bet uh, because he's very, very famous in the marketing space. However, I'm, I'm going to give a quick introduction because I bet there's a few people who uh, maybe are brand new to the marketing world, don't know who he is. Um, and it's always good just to, to do these things because, you know, I respect Frank so much and I want to I want to um, give him an awesome intro. So Frank's had a 20 year career, right? Uh, 20 year long career. He started in about 1999 and he helps about 100,000 businesses um, with their marketing. Right? He's the go to guy for their marketing. And th- these businesses aren't just uh, all small businesses. In fact, uh, one of his clients is Tony Robbins. And actually, if you go on YouTube, you can see uh, there's a couple of interviews where, where Tony has actually interviewed Frank. And those are some of my favorite videos on marketing on YouTube. In fact, when I in the beginning, when I started my business, um, part of my uh, conditioning to try and uh, program my mind to believe that I could actually generate wealth online was just watching a video with uh, Frank Kern, Tony Robbins and John Reese over and over again uh, to the point where it just became normal that they were talking about making millions online. Uh, and, and that was one of the things that, that kind of enabled me to brainwash myself to believe that it was, you know, it might just be possible for me to do. So if it wasn't for that video and, and you know, videos like that, if it wasn't for the, the influence that Frank had on uh, the marketing world, then who knows, I probably wouldn't be here uh, talking to you today. Now, he sold tens of millions online, right? He's responsible for some of the biggest launches in internet marketing history. One of them, uh, he actually generated $23.8 million in sales in a 24-hour period. So he's done some pretty crazy stuff, but his main kind of message uh, that he likes uh, to teach is that the most reliable and predictable way to grow a business is by turning advertising into profit. Now, this is a big, big, big um, subject, and uh, I think it's 100% true. Like, you can definitely go down the route of content marketing. Uh, You can build a blog. You can start a podcast like I'm doing today. You know, all that stuff is fantastic for building an audience and building a customer base. But really, nothing is more reliable and predictable than learning how to master advertising. And through the stuff he's taught, um, he's, he's actually enabled me to do my first launch a couple of years ago. I used his math control program uh, to do a launch, which which resulted in about $30,000 in sales uh, generated in a week, which to me was like, you know, like 30 million. <laughs> that was unbelievably uh, uh, unbelievable for my first launch. And that's thanks to Frank. I've been in his inner circle since it started. And through that, actually, that helped me learn how to 
get customers on autopilot. Um, one of the main funnels I use in my coaching business is a book funnel that, that Frank pretty much taught me how to how to build. And that gets me about 100 customers a week at break even. So he's definitely added a lot of value to me. And that's why I was so excited to interview him because I know this interview is going to bring you a ton of value. So it brings me great pleasure to introduce my interview with the one and only Frank Kern. Hey Frank, very, very warm welcome to the Marketing Bytes podcast. Thanks for having me. I, I think it might sound like I'm in a wind tunnel. My air conditioning <laughs> is super loud right now, so sorry about that. Well, we can pretend that I'm coming from an airplane or something if it sounds more interesting. That would be cool. I'm jealous that you have air conditioning because here in Stockholm it's absolutely boiling and uh, I'm just sweating. So. <laughs> oh man, all right. Well, yeah. yeah, I'll stop complaining then. Perfect. So I'd really like to start from the beginning. Um, I've, I've heard a lot about your background. Um, you started uh, as an entrepreneur when you were relatively young, and I remember you saying that you learned uh, quite a lot from your grandfather. Uh, so I was interested to, to, to sort of start off by asking you, like, what was the most important lesson that your grandfather gave you uh, in the early stages as you were getting moving? Well, he never really talked, so it was all by demonstration. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were two. Uh, number one was that expect nothing. Mm. So it was, um, he had the saying that uh, if it's going to be, it's up to me, uh, which is like on the seven times that he ever really spoke or held a conversation. Yeah, he was one of those World War II era guys that just didn't really talk ever. Right. Uh, really, really adamant about that, that, listen, you have to be responsible for everything um, or else nothing will come to you. You know, you're going to see for you or you're handing over your responsibility to someone else and prepare to pay the price for that. Uh, so that was number one. And number two was he was always really cool to everybody. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's where the foundation of the whole results in advance approach and the intent-based branding approach came from, which was watching him because he would work very hard. I don't even know if it was consciously, but he would work very hard to establish a really good relationship with everyone he came into and to contact with. And then when it came time for someone to do business with them, that relationship was so strong that there was very little salesmanship involved. I mean, he was a very charismatic person um, mm. when he when he wanted to be, you know. Uh, so, but he never was like your typical salesperson or anything like that. But people would be gravitated towards him due to the relationship he created with them, and then the reputation he built um, as a result of being so cool to everybody. So those were the two big takeaways. That's fascinating. I can see how that's reflected in, in your career and the stuff that you teach. So he was an entrepreneur then? He was. He jumped out of the school window in the eighth grade. I think this, uh, well, he's passed away now, so <laughs> I don't really have any way to verify the story, but I think that was that was the grade he was in. Eighth grade, he literally jumped out of the window. No the way. And, wow. Um, started working. Yeah, one of his earlier jobs at 13 years old and was driving a log truck. You could imagine a 13 year old driving a logging truck and he drove it from South Georgia to New York and wow. uh, he wrecked it and <laughs> it over, you know, mm -hmm. it's like, gosh, dude, I mean, when I was 13, I, I don't even remember what I was doing. Nothing of any importance, much less driving a log truck, you know, across <laughs> the country. It's crazy. Wow. That's unbelievable. So he, he gave you your, your first start. So, so what would you say was, was like the most pivotal, pivotal moment? Uh, like in the beginning when you were just getting moving uh, as an entrepreneur, when you realized, you know, I could really actually make something happen if I had my own business. Um, it was when I realized that I was not cut out for civilian life, for lack of a better word. And, and I'll define civilian life by being, you know, having a nine to five or whatever. And there's not, absolutely nothing wrong with that at all. Um, it just wasn't for me. I, I couldn't do it. I was terrible at it. And, um, I, I looked at him and realized, you know, once I started thinking about actually making money and thinking about doing something other than being a, you know, a drunken rock and roll guitar player and everything, which is what most of my early life was spent doing, um, I realized that the only choice I had was to either become a civilian and just have a job or whatever. And I had no education of any kind um, and no qualifications or to try to figure out how to start a business and, basically be like my grandfather, you know, and make my own way. And one of the first things you tried to do was selling credit card machines. Is that right? 
And that was like the 20th thing that I tried to do. So oh, the really? The first thing that I tried to do was buying and selling cars because my mm -hmm. grandfather was a car dealer. He was retired when I started really getting to know him. But his, his business history was he, you know, he jumped out of the school window, joined the Marine Corps when I think he was 17, uh, fought in the Solomon Islands in World War II, was wounded. I believe he never spoke about him. I think he stepped on a landmine and uh, it gave him a really bad eye injury, which was kind of awesome. Because he, wore, he got to wear sunglasses all the time, like even inside, so he always looked really cool. Um, so that was good. But he, uh, he came back from the war, married my grandmother, and they opened a, a gas station. And the gas station served gas and food. And he would pump the gas, my grandmother would cook the food, and they started buying old cars. Well, I mean, it was old back then anyway. So they would buy used cars and then they would sell them from the gas station. And he built that into you know just a little country car lot and then into multiple franchises of cars, uh, BMW, um, Volkswagen, Subaru, like you know your typical, usual major brand franchises of cars. Right. And then sold that and started investing in, in um, real estate. So when I was about 18 years old or 19, I think, I was living in Athens, Georgia. I was a, uh, I was a failed musician. I never did make it as a musician. And I, I watched a movie or something made me make the decision of, you know, I'm going to go and talk to my grandfather and try to learn about business. So I, I drove down to Macon, which is where he lived and where I was born, mm -hmm. and uh, went to visit him in the hospital. He had just had back surgery and he was in recovery from back surgery. And I start talking to him and he's, I remember just being amazed because he was doing math in his head, like a human calculator while recovering from back surgery on opiate narcotics. Um, wow. He wasn't a narcotic user by any means, but he was, you know, in the freaking hospital, he just had this horrible back surgery. And he said, you know, if you want to learn business, um, I want you to, uh, I'm going to give you 10,000 bucks as seed money and I want you to hook up with your cousins um, and I, I want them to show you how to buy cars at auction and sell them. And so I was like, really? Okay, good Lord. You know, man, dude, I had never, I had no idea what I was doing. Right. So he said, go try this. And I said, okay. And to me, 10,000 bucks was like a billion. So I hook up with these two cousins mm -hmm. who were really, really cool. They were both also completely insane. And um, I would go to <laughs> the Albany. I mean, like, <laughs> this stuff was like straight out of a movie, man. So I would go to the Albany, Georgia uh, dealers only used car auction where you could buy like little beaters, you know, for 800 bucks and try to fix them up and sell them for, you know, $1,500 or something. And I, I started doing that with uh, a moderate amount of success. You know, sometimes I'd get a good one and I'd be able to sell it, make a couple hundred bucks. And then I get a bad one and uh, I would lose the money because I had to fix it, you know, cause I don't mm -hmm. know any about cars. And that was the very first attempt. And um, I ended up not losing all of the money, thankfully. And made about enough to pay for beer and my little two hundred dollar month apartment and things like that. Um, and I'm forever grateful for the experience. You know, it was it was really something. I learned very quickly that it's it's not easy out there, no matter what the business is. It's fascinating that you had your grandfather give you so much confidence and and, and like a springboard to actually dive into this stuff. So how how did it transition then into online selling? Um, well, so I stopped doing the car thing um, because I just, I wasn't good at it, you know, and thankfully didn't lose all of the money. That was very good. And ended up trying a bunch of other businesses. One of them, interestingly enough, though, about the car thing, I actually sold a car to an honest to God serial killer. <laughs> uh, I obviously didn't know at the time, but it was this kid. Um, I can't remember the guy's name. I'm totally blanking out, but he, I sold him this car. He had a, an old Camaro and traded the Camaro in with a little bit of money for this. No, I'm sorry. He had a giant super truck, like a monster truck that was right. all, you know, redneck thing. He traded that in for an old crappy Camaro. <laughs> so we did the trade. And then like, I think it was eight months later, the guy murdered two uh, college students at this campsite, just shot them with a deer rifle. It was really, wow. really crazy story. And it was like all over the news and CNN and stuff. Cause his father, it turns out was an FBI agent. It was like really crazy. Um, so that's just a weird side note, but I had multiple <laughs> failures between then and the time that I got into online sales. And what drove me to online sales was I was doing door to door credit card machine sales and was really tired of the personal rejection. Um, 
because I'm an introvert, like a really serious level 50 introvert. And mm -hmm. uh, it was, you know, I was cold calling and people would throw me out of their businesses. They didn't want to see me. And I finally went and I got online. This is before Google, so I can't remember what search engine I used and typed in how to sell credit card machines over the internet and um, saw an ad for an info course uh, by a guy named Corey Rudel. It was 297 bucks. And I looked at the sales letter 7,000 times, you know, and um, eventually bought it a week later. Yeah, I actually split the cost with a friend of mine. And, and that was the beginning of the whole thing. I got hooked from that point forward of seeing what was possible. Wow. So soon after that, um, I think a lot of people have heard the story. Um, you had some success. You, you sold a few products online. And then sooner or later, you had some trouble uh, with the FTC. Is, this, is that right? It is indeed. Yeah, I got um, I actually got lucky with that whole thing. As strange as it sounds. So the, the brief version of that whole situation is I bought this course. It was excellent. It taught really good advice. Hmm. Is this off Corey? Is that, is that the one? Yeah, or and on one of the pages in the course, remember this is 1999, hmm. one of the pages in the course, it said something, so imagine like the course is 300 something pages, and so one paragraph, like one sentence of one paragraph of one page said something along the lines of, it is physically, theoretically possible for you to make money if you send spam. <laughs> you know, so right. instead of actually trying to do anything, I read that to be like, oh, I should probably send spam. So. I went really deep in the rabbit hole of uh, trying to figure out how to send spam. This is before it was illegal. The, pam, the can spam thing wasn't done at that point. It's just that everybody hated it. So mm -hmm. I started buying reprint rights to products about marketing. And um, I got a, run a reprint rights to a bunch of really excellent products, like these old direct mail seminars and stuff. So I'd send out spam and I'd say, hey, learn how to you know, sell things. Uh, and then people would respond and then I would send them, I'd put them in an autoresponder and that would ultimately sell them this big box of uh, direct mail seminar tapes, you know, um, then I'd sell it for 300 bucks or something like that. And I remember I, I lived in this little 1200 square foot house in the mountains of North Carolina and I would physically mail people these big boxes of stuff that I would pack up in my house and everything. And that was working okay, but it was selling things via spam was about 9 million times harder than selling it the right way. Um, and what would happen was I would sell this thing for 300 bucks and then people, some people would love it and some people would return it because they'd say, I really want to, these are things about direct mail and I'm interested in selling things online. Uh, so right around that same time, you know, fast forward to maybe 2001 or something, uh, the ebook craze got pretty big in the marketing world. And right. a really classic offer that you would see all over the place was that someone would create an ebook um, about marketing and they would sell the ebook for 20 bucks or whatever. And if you bought it, you could also have the reprint rights to not only resell that ebook, but you could also grant other people the license to resell that ebook. It was called Master Reprint Rights. So I was thinking, man, this is pretty, this is a pretty good offer, you know, because the ebooks are good. Um, you know, if people want to learn how to sell stuff, they can just resell these in ebooks. So I put together a, a, a package of them. I think it was like five or six individual ebooks that I bought the reprint rights to. And I wrote the sales letter for it. And interestingly enough, I wrote the sales letter by hand and uh, I was in the uh, a class to get my real estate license. And I don't know why I was doing that, um, but whatever I was. And so I handled this long sales letter in that class. I go home, I type it up on the computer I, in Dreamweaver. I put the website up and um, I send an email out to my list, which had been built by spam. You know, these are people who had gotten the spam and then they'd said, yes, I'm interested. And then I put them on a real list, you know. Mm -hmm. And I sent the, the thing out to that list and it sold like crazy. I remember making like 2000 bucks or something in my first day and absolutely freaking out because it was, there was nothing for me to ship. It was a $47 product. And I thought I was like set for life, you know? So was this your first information product sale online? This was the first experience. It was the first digitally delivered deliverable one. Yeah. So the wow. first thing I sold online was this, you know, like old direct mail tapes and stuff. Yeah. Cause remember that, you know, we're going all the way back to 99 through 2001. So this is, Really, everything was in its infancy. But yeah, the thing that was the first thing that was actually downloadable was this product, and the product was good. People loved it, you know, and um, it was really cool. And where I went wrong with that was two parts. The first part is I said in my headline, 
my little business made X amount of dollars um, and you can too. And those three words, you can too, are the kiss of death, which I did not know at the time. A lot of people still don't know this, which is why I'm really happy to tell this story. If you say something like that, it's not illegal um, to say it, but you have to be able to substantiate it. And what substantiation means is you have to be able to show that the average person who buys whatever it is you're selling gets the result that you're implying. So if my thing said I sold $100,000 worth of stuff, uh, because I had like my little spam business, I didn't really make much net, but I did a, you know about 100 grand in volume, mm-hmm. I would have to be able to, to say that the average person who buys this little $47 thing is going to make a hundred thousand bucks, and I couldn't, and nor did I did I mean to imply that in any way. You know, I was just saying, hey, theoretically, you could too. Yeah. So that was mistake number one. That was the biggest one. Mistake number two was I gave people the right to resell that thing and to resell those rights as well, and use my sales letter. Um, so what ended up happening over a very brief amount of time is the product became very popular, and people would buy it. And they would just copy the sales letter exactly and they would use my name and then they would send out spam uh, with my name on it. <laughs> you know, so, like, All right, so you started a chain reaction. <laughs> yes. And then the, uh, one of the companies who would do that um, would then t- call their customers on the phone and st- like from a boiler room and I don't think it was an actual boiler room, you know, but whatever, a phone room. Mm-hmm. And then they would sell them this expensive quote unquote coaching stuff that the customers were unhappy with and they wouldn't give refunds. So all of this is happening before I got sued by the federal trade commission. Um, I found out about that company. I call them, I send them a cease and desist letter. They stop. Uh, I eventually stopped selling that product because I was like, it was a little gimmicky and I'm like, okay, you know, I'm kind of getting the hang of all of this stuff. I have a little bit more to offer than just selling this dumb little reprint rights thing. And, um, Long story short, in 2003, I get a lawsuit from the Federal Trade Commission because of that product. And uh, what's really embarrassing, way more embarrassing than having been sued by the FTC, was the fact that I did not know that they existed prior to getting sued. Wow. So I was like completely ignorant of any sort of advertising guidelines or regulations whatsoever. Um, <laughs> you know, which is like, <laughs> dude like what in the hell you know I mean, at this point this i had sold something like six hundred thousand dollars that one product i had other offers going everything was cool no idea who the ftc was no idea about legal compliance i had our family's tax attorney review my advertising because i thought all lawyers were the same you know and so of course he didn't know what the heck he was looking for he's like i don't know it looks okay to me go ahead <laughs> you know so ftc sues me and um and, and so i'm like man this is a this really sucks. I'm very, very nervous and very afraid right now. And uh, I've hired an attorney, actually two of them. And one of them uh, used to work for the Federal Trade Commission. And, you know, I'll, I'll paraphrase here. But he was basically like, fellas, what, what's the deal? I and mean, this is some guys in South Georgia. He's nobody. Uh, you know, what's, the, what's going on? And they forwarded over all these consumer complaints. And it turns out the consumer complaints were about that company that was not ah. it was, it was using my name. And I thought at that moment, man, I was like, oh, thank God. You know, this isn't me. I can show them it's not me. I can right. show them. I sent these guys a cease and desist letter over a year ago. I can help them get these guys. And um, we, we made that response. And uh, I'll paraphrase again, but they were essentially their position was, dude, we don't care. Your dumbass made the product and made the original ad that they spammed. So it's your responsibility, which all ties back to what I learned from my grandfather. It's like, it's all your responsibility. Yeah, you know? mm-hmm. <laughs> so it's like okay, I get it now. So um, that was that was really awful, and it was also the best thing that ever happened. Because had that not happened, I would have never really become a student of direct response, and I would have never really taken it seriously. And I probably would have ended up being one of those get rich quick on the internet people. And I really don't care for those folks, you know. So mm. uh, I hope anyone listening to this, if they haven't gone to sleep yet gets the point of, you know, really understand the regulations uh, when it comes to advertising and stuff, because what you don't know can and will hurt you. That's fascinating. That's, yeah, that's, that's really, really important. So I'm really curious to know, so after you had this experience, and I assume, did, did they actually come to your house? Like, that must have been terrifying. Uh, no, um, they didn't. It wasn't like in the movies, because right. 
it was not a criminal thing. I mean, the FTC has sued everybody. Uh, you know, Amazon, uh, I think Apple, uh, you know, I mean, this, they, it's really easy to screw up with these guys because there's a right. lot of regulations and this. You have to make a conscious effort to actually learn them. You know, it's not that easy to figure out. So um, just a guy came to the house and handed me a bunch of papers and said, bye. That was it. There were no stormtroopers invading the home or anything <laughs> terrible. Like that was really bad. They were just like, hey, we're suing you because you did this wrong and, you know, you're stupid. I mean, they, they worded it better, obviously. And they were actually pretty nice, I mean, considering. And, you know, so they probably could have really killed me and um, they didn't because I think they realized, oh, this is just a moron in the back of Georgia who has no idea what he's doing. And mm. we're going to sue him anyway because he's an idiot, but we're not going to like salt the earth or anything with him, which I'm very grateful for. Right. So it was more of a slap on the wrist. No, so, I mean, it was, you know, it was, it was civil. It wasn't like a, Hey, you broke the law. We're sending you to jail. It was all right. There's a regulation here. You gotta, you know, you have to give all the money back that you, that you got from selling this thing because it, it doesn't count. You know, you can't sell something if you don't follow these regulations and you did. So you have to give it back to the consumer. Ah, uh, so you literally had to pay everybody back. Well, I paid them and they paid everybody back. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So after that, then, were you kind of a bit freaked out and, and thinking, you know, is this really the right path for me? Or were you just like, you know, now I'm going to do it properly? I was beyond freaked out because I thought they hated me. I was like, and I have, you know, when you get sued by the Federal Trade Commission, it's not like a friendly, like, okay, hi, we're the Federal Trade Commission and we're going to see you today. It's, you know, they come in guns blazing because for, for all they know, you're a degenerate, you know? So hmm. they're like, Hey, we're you. You are terrible, and you've done all this stuff wrong. And it's time to pay the piper. And um, even though they were, you know, they ended up being pretty cool to me. They're like, "Yeah, man, whatever. Just pay it back and don't do it again, dummy." You know, it still scared the hell out of me. Yeah. Um, so I was, I was afraid to sell anything marketing related at all because I was like, hey, "Maybe it'll make them mad," you know. Um, so I went into a completely different direction and took everything I learned from all those things I had the reprint rights to, I actually listened to them and, you know, followed the direction and created a totally different business in the pet market. And it worked and it was great. So was this the parrot thing first or the dog thing? It was uh, the parrot thing first and that went okay. And then the dog thing exploded because it was such a bigger market. And uh... I was able to really pitch it down, you know. So I created, um, I created a product that was a one-size-fits-all obedience training product for dogs. And then I created ads for every breed of dog in the world, of which there are over 600. So that gave me a 600x reach over just one specific niche. You know, so I had 600 sets of ads over 600 sets of dog breed related keywords and 600 different autoresponder follow up messages and stuff. It was crazy, and it wow. worked great. And I understand was that your first uh, million dollar a year business? It was. Yeah. It sounds I so million dollars a year, you know, but still counting it <laughs> yeah, yeah absolutely it sounds so unbelievably complex for a million dollar business uh it was not so i um for lack of a better word invented this methodology that i called serialization which was if you have a market that's broad like dogs for example and that market is made up of a bunch of sub market like dog breeds for example and mm -hmm. you have a one size fits all product the way my information on training a uh, basic obedience training, you know, not like performance training or whatever, but basic obedience training for a uh, chihuahua is going to be exactly the same basic obedience training you would use for a Cavalier King Charles Spaniel or something. A dog's a dog in this particular context, you know. So what I created was the system where I had some software built that I could feed a list of every breed of dog known to man into this machine, basically. And it would find every keyword that was related to each of those breeds. And then it would go to Google AdWords and it would create an ad group for every dog breed. And it would say, before you train your schnauzer, read this free report. You know, three mistakes you make when you're trying to train your schnauzer. Right. And the landing page would dynamically update with the word schnauzer based on what the URL was. So it would be like dog stuff. That's not really the site. I can't remember the site. I mean, it was like dogstuff.com forward slash schnauzer. And so all of this was automated. So if you just replace like Doberman at, instead of schnauzer, the website would say Doberman on it. And then when they opted in, all of the follow-ups would be dynamically created based on 
what the original URL was, you know? So it seems like I had to build all of these 600 something funnels, but in reality I built one wow. and I used that software and that approach that I created to splinter it out into all of those various sub markets. So that's what gave me that reach there. And uh, it was great. You know, I ran it all in Google AdWords and it was, uh, I, I sold a $47 dog training offer and never had never sold anything else like an idiot i mean it, it could have been a huge business you know? yeah with just, the back end and stuff yeah yeah but i just sold them the one thing for 47 bucks and that was it um and still made a profit so i didn't make a wow. million dollars uh, uh, on that i probably netted like three or four hundred thousand or something from that business great so soon after this you decided um and i remember you, you, you describing it as being like a decision you wanted to, to teach the marketing stuff again. Was, was that right? Did that happen shortly after the, the dog thing? There were two things that happened in between that, three actually. The first was people uh, began to get wise, like marketers began to get wise to the, the technology and the approach I was using. And as you know, internet marketing is a very incestuous world. Yeah. So definitely. I began, I got very uh, nervous that people were going to rip off the idea and they would like someone would screw it up and they would create a software application or something that would model what I did and they would sell it for like ten dollars or something on the warrior forum or whatever you know mm -hmm. so I decided to preemptively strike against that by holding a, a seminar where I would give people the software I would teach them everything I knew about this particular type of um, marketing and I would charge a lot of money for it and I would limit it to a hundred people ever learning it. And so I sold that. I went to, I had a list of about 8,000 people left over from pre FTC days that um, thankfully they liked me because the thing that I sold and I got in trouble for was actually was pretty good. They liked it, you know? Um, mm -hmm. So that was great. I got lucky there that, uh, that I've still had a really good relationship with all those customers and I offered that seminar to them and that worked. So, I did two events, one had 35 people and the other had 65 people and it was $10,000 person or $10,000 a head. And so that was the first time I ever like really made a million bucks, you know, that was mostly net. The events cost a little money, but it was, I was like, oh my gosh, this is great, you know. Um, yeah. And they were all really happy and everything was awesome. I'd never done a seminar in my life, and much less charge 10 grand for one. So I was very, very nervous, but it worked. So that was thing number one. Thing number two, is I had just by a random chance, my cousin Trey and I decided to reach out to an author named Neil Strauss, who we didn't know. He was a New York Times bestselling author who had written a, a book of dating advice for men. And we reached out to him and said, hey, if you'll create a home study course for these guys, we'll help you market it and do everything for you if you'll split the, the money with us. And he miraculously said yes. So we did that and it worked. So that was thing number two. We. Um, sold 375 copies of his dating course. I think it was 3,500 bucks per copy or something like that. So that was really good. So and how much was that total net? That was a big launch, right? It was pretty successful. Yeah, it was uh, one point something million bucks, you know, and uh, there were costs involved in everything. So I can't remember what the net was. I think Trey and I might have shared around 400,000 in royalties from it, which was mm -hmm. awesome because we never, you know, I'd never done anything like that before ever going, you know, this is in 2006, I think. So it was just three years prior to that. I'd been sued by the FTC. I found it very humiliating. I was really embarrassed by it and still kind of weirded out by it, you know, it was, um, you never want to get the American government mad at you. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> of course. Uh, you know, a lot of people have these theories like, oh, the government's horrible and they hate everybody. And I didn't find that to be true, but you still don't want them to be mad at you. Like Mike Tyson's probably a pretty nice guy, but you don't want to pick a fight with him, you know, so, exactly. he'll beat the hell out of you. so I was all weirded out and um, just, it, it worked anyway. Neil was super cool to me. And uh, so that happened. So that combined with that event, it started giving me a lot of confidence that, you know, maybe I, I should teach some of this stuff because I'm pretty good at it. Um, and what, what ended up going through my mind was, okay, here's a market that's growing, which is people wanting to learn how to sell things online. A lot of people who are teaching are good. There is a caveat that most of them have only sold how to make money online stuff. And I started doing that. I got hammered by the feds, uh, rightfully so, because I made stupid mistakes due to ignorance. And then I did seven figures in the dog business, and I did seven figures in this dating advice business. And the funny thing was, I like know nothing about dating, you know. So uh, 
like I'm horrible. Now Neil was brilliant at it, and, but I was the guy writing the copy. My cousin and I were, and, and both of us were just completely pathetic in that department. <laughs> so I was like, gosh, you know, maybe I should teach this stuff, and um, and, and go out there and just not make the same mistake twice, and not make unsubstantiated income claims. Now that I know the stupid regulations, you know, now that I actually know what not to do, I'll simply not do it, and uh, maybe everything will be cool. So. That's when I decided to get back in the ring, so to speak. So this led to a string of successful launches, right? And you were known primarily as a guy that does huge launches. Is, is that a good summary at that at that time? I think so. Yeah. So um, I, d I decided to, if I was going to do it and be an internet marketing guy, I wanted to be the most famous and popular one ever. So. Um, I made that conscious decision and I built marketing uh, to support that. So I, I was maybe the first, I don't remember, because also during that entire era, I drank constantly and took a tremendous amount of drugs. So <laughs> the whole experience is a little hazy, embarrassingly. But um, I, I deliberately turned myself into a, uh, a celebrity in that industry. You know, I made videos that felt like documentaries, videos that felt like movies. and. Um, did a lot of emotional anchoring and stuff in there, and uh, it really, really worked well. So I didn't really try to take the positioning of a guy that did really huge launches that I can recall, but I did do really huge launches. So maybe it's embarrassing not to remember this, you know, but I really <laughs> don't remember it because, A, it was about, you know, 12 years ago or something, and B, I was blasted out of my mind the entire time, which is embarrassing but true. Fascinating. Yeah, I think... Um a lot of people saw you as the lifestyle guy, the the, the surfer dude who 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 lays back and, and makes a ton of cash. Uh, That's true. Is, um, I, I, awesome... mean, I really did live that lifestyle, even more yeah. so than I went on. So I lived at the beach. I surfed all the time, and uh, it was a, a great lifestyle. What I do remember is the net wasn't as high as it is today, because so much stuff was affiliate driven back then and that's a, um, in my opinion a terrible business model because you pay more in affiliate commissions than you know than you would if you like actually did real advertising so that was a huge lesson from all of that so this is exactly what i wanted to segue to now so you 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 were focused on affiliates uh, launches you're with all the other guys who love doing launches and then you you transitioned from that to, to more of a focus on paid advertising. So how did this take place? When did you decide that that was the right thing to do? I um, didn't enjoy being an internet marketing guru. Number one, I was like, you know, this is cool, but it's, it seems like a lot of extraneous work. Like you, you build a product, you do a, a big product launch, and there's, you know, the product launch methodology and product launch formula is brilliant. I mean, it, it really is. I don't think it should be the only thing in someone's arsenal which it was for me at that time. So I would do all of this work. I'd do a, a big launch and it would either be successful or not. And it would look like it was amazing because it would be several million dollars or whatever. But most of that would be paid in, in expense, overhead, commissions, and all of that kind of stuff. So, you know, if you do a million dollar launch, you might be left with a quarter million bucks in actual revenue. And, I was, and then mm -hmm. the launch is over and you have to do it all again, you know? So it's like, this doesn't really make very much sense. And I started to feel like, I shouldn't be teaching because what was I going to show people like, okay, well, here's how to do a big launch and to get other people to endorse you. But what if they won't? Well, I'd have no, there was no real backup plan. You know, I had, I had, it had been so long since I'd been doing ads because in my dog business, it was all AdWords driven. So it had been so long since I did that. I didn't feel like I was qualified to teach that um, advertising and I, I just didn't feel right about it. So it was really a double, it was a two-pronged decision, you know, number one, it's just not smart business not to learn advertising. And number two, I didn't feel qualified to really give advice unless I had gotten good at turning complete strangers, not endorsed strangers from a joint venture arrangement, but at complete total strangers into customers. Um, so that was the decision, you know. That makes a lot of sense. So. What advice would you have for, say, someone new who, you know, wants to place their first ad? Like, what are the key skills that you need to learn in order to make paid advertising really work? So this is, um, this is an interesting topic, really. I would, I'd first of all, tell them to think long term. 
uh, the biggest mistake I made in, in running ads and the biggest mistake I see people making is they'll, so let's say they run a $500 test and they're, you know, if they don't get that $500 back plus a profit in like seven days or whatever, that it's the end of the world to them. So that's the number one is you got to, you don't try to do that. I mean, if you do, it's great, but really think more long term in terms of lifetime customer value and overall return on your ad spend over, you know, a 90 day or six month period or whatever. So that's thing number one. Thing number two is embrace the risk. What's really interesting is um, I don't work with many beginners anymore, but when I did, I would see people that would happily go out and spend thousands of dollars on training and like, okay, whatever. And then to get them to risk a hundred dollars or $50 or whatever on an ad was like pulling teeth. And when it didn't work immediately, they would totally freak out. They'd be like, Oh my God, I lost $50. It's like, well, dude, you lost thousands of dollars on these trainings you did nothing with. So which would you rather play with, you know, like just keep buying this information and do nothing with it or actually get in the game. So the definition of entrepreneur, I think, is someone who actually takes risk in business. And that's what advertising is. It's risk. You try to mitigate against the risk by having good ad copy, of course, having a really good offer, having a good retargeting strategy, having a good email follow-up strategy, a good sales process and all that, but it's still risk. So the number one thing I would tell new people is be okay with risk. Don't be afraid to, you know, lose a little money. It's going to happen to everybody. Um, and just get in the game. That makes sense. And and also another um, a mindset shift that you mentioned that you had or you wanted people to have is to not think like an internet marketer, but think more like an investor. Can you expand a little bit on that? Yeah, I would, I would avoid thinking like an internet marketer in any circumstance. <laughs> they have a terrible... Uh, reputation to be fair well it's you know and look we deserve it uh, so it's our fault um as a community we've brought it on ourselves you know but that doesn't mean we have to keep doing it so that's thing number one um but yeah i mean business like i like to quote you know that show eastbound and down the character kenny powers he always says you know i can play real sports i'm not trying to be the best at, at uh, exercise uh you know and i that's the way i think anyone should look at business period it's like real it's a real business and the way business works is it's a long-term play. And if you think about what it really is, any business is this. It is you take money and you multiply it by leveraging assets. And in our case, those assets are ads, their funnels, their sales processes, and they are the products that we sell. So the, the formula is you put money into advertising and then you get more money than you put out as a result of deploying these assets that I mentioned. Um, and so if you think about, well, I got to make my money back today. If I spend a thousand dollars on ads today, I got to get $2,000 back today. It's you're essentially trying to get a hundred percent return on your investment in 24 hours. If you look at the most you know, successful investors of all time, like Warren Buffett, for example, is a really, really famous. I think his average annual return is 21%. Meaning if he spent it, took a thousand dollars and put it in, he would get $210 back after a year. Right. So, in our business in advertising, first of all, that's, that would really not be that great of a return on advertising investment, but it's still better than Warren freaking Buffett. You know, <laughs> so it's like, if we can start thinking of, okay, I'm gonna build everything so I can put $1,000 in or whatever, $100,000 in, and within 90 days, I'm going to get, you know, my 100, maybe I'll get $110,000 back, but now those customers are going to go on and over another 90 day period, they're going to buy another hundred thousand dollars worth of stuff. Well, that's 110% return over six months. Like if you did that on wall street and real estate, whatever you're, you'd be on the cover of every magazine. And that is not uncommon in a real business in an advertising environment when done correctly. It's hard to do. I don't want to make it, I don't want to minimize it and make it sound easy to get that type of return. But even, you know, you put a thousand dollars in and over, 90 days or six months, you, you double your money. It's, you know, it's not really that unusual. 50% is really common, you know, that's nothing. So it's all in the way you look at it. And if we look at it as internet marketers, which is, oh, we gotta get rich like right now, I gotta have a $20,000 every day or whatever. It's, it's just short-term thinking and it causes stress and overwhelm and it sucks. <laughs> you know? But Absolutely. the long-term approach works great. Yeah, that, that's fascinating. Every time I've tried to do sort of a short-term gain promotion, it's, it's almost always backfired. Uh, so, I, yeah, it just makes so much sense. So, um, a, a few years ago, 
uh, I noticed you had a shift. Uh, you kind of shifted from uh, doing like a new promotion sort of every month and, um, you know, selling, you know, doing a new launch or a new email series, uh, selling different products, and you transitioned to just focusing all of your energy on one product. And that's when you started the Inner Circle, I believe it was, was it August in 2016? It was. I think I, think I joined on, on day one. And uh, yeah, no, it's, it's an awesome program. Um, and so th this must have transformed your whole entire business. And I've got a sneaking suspicion that through this transformation is when you started to develop the stabilize, optimize, expand methodology. Uh, is that right? Did those two things sort of happen together? I didn't start thinking about stabilize, optimize, expand until maybe it was six months to a year ago. Ah, right. Yeah, um, the inner circle was it was born out of, uh, you know, so to, to tell the story mercifully quickly, uh, I had, you know, I'd gotten out of the launch space, I started running ads, everything was, was going okay, but I, you know, I kept on having to make new offers to my list and everything all the time, and it seemed like every month was the start of a new month, so if we had a good month last month, and we're starting at zero this month, and it's, it's stressful. Um, so I went back, and... Uh, I looked at all of the anal analytics of everything I'd done since 2008, and I learned that one promotion uh, that I thought was a loser actually over time, for about a three-year period, it ended up making three million bucks, and that was a monthly program. And I had the revelation of, oh my God, what if I'd just been doing this the entire time? <laughs> you know, like, right. So I immediately re relaunched it and, and focused all of our efforts on that from, uh, from I think it was May of 2016 until... Um, January of 2018, we started to diversify a little bit, and that created the inner circle, which grew up to about a half a million dollars in revenue, and it was awesome. And uh, it was working with those clients over time that I realized there was this pattern, and that people were trying to, to jump ahead. So, uh, you know, the stabilize, optimize, expand comes from this idea that what happens is an entrepreneur will hustle and they'll be successful and they'll they'll start making money, and then they go try to do something else come up with another offer or whatever, and they go straight into trying to expand the business. When in reality, the business isn't even stable yet. Like they don't even really have a consistent and stable process to put a dollar in and get a dollar or two dollars back out over a certain amount of time with any consistency. So our problems entrepreneurially come from when we try to jump that process. You know, we don't actually build a stable system for acquiring customers at a profit. And then once we have it and we don't take the time to try to tweak it and make it really, really good, uh, we go straight to let's come up with another offer <laughs> you know, and start trying to run that. And that becomes mm -hmm. very stressful and everything sucks. So that was, that was born out of just working with a, a large membership base every other week on these video conferences and trying to coach them through it. Yeah. And you helped me with that. And uh, one, I mean, before you introduced this methodology, uh, that was, I mean, you pretty much just described exactly what I was doing. I would have something that would work. It would be great. You know, you get a massive dopamine rush and then you instantly throw all the funnels away and just restart from scratch. Like you're building a new business almost every single month. Uh, and ha having this realization was, uh, yeah, it gave me a lot of clarity. Um, so this, this kind of coincides with how to build like a stable business and how to actually um, just focus on one thing and, and get it um, really solid. So what would you say is like the main mindset differences between people who have, say, six-figure businesses who are doing well, um, but, but what differentiates them from, say, a seven- or eight-figure business owner who's like really taking things to the next level, you know, building like what you might describe as a gazelle company and has a really, really stable profitable business is it all right if i'm like slightly inappropriate in this answer i'd welcome it yeah because i don't want you to have explicit in your podcast all right so <laughs> there's this movie called colors about the gangs of la it was it came out in the 80s and i can't even remember what happened in the movie i just remember the end so at the end these two cops after having successfully defeated the evil scourge of the street gangs etc they're talking to each other and there's an old cop cop and a, a young cop and the young cop like, wants to go do something exciting or drastic or whatever and the old cop looks at him and he tells him this story slash joke and I'll try to clean up the joke a little bit he goes you know it reminds me of this uh, this story about these two bulls they're two bulls and they're sitting on top of this hill and the young bull looks over to the old bull and he goes hey 
why don't we run down that hill and have our way with all of those cows that are down by that tree at the bottom of that hill? And the old cop looks at him and he goes, I have a better idea. Why don't we walk down that hill and have our way with all of those cows uh, down there? And the point of the joke is if you just walk and you take it easy, you can have everything. But if you spread, you might get one. And a six-figure to seven, like early seven-figure business, they're in sprint mode. Like that's when you're hustling, you know. So when you see all these folks and they're saying, "Hey, you got to hustle, you got to grind, and everything," they're right. That's what gets you to the seven-figure mark. You never want to lose that hunger, but eventually you have to stop sprinting, and you have to shift the the motor from first gear into like fifth gear by starting to think about doing just a few things really, really well instead of doing everything. So that, that difference is really the biggest one. A, a bigger business will think, I'm, I'm in this for the longer term. I'm not going to try to get you know a huge, like yeah, I'm not gonna think in terms of how much money am I making today or this month or whatever. I'm starting to think annually, five year pictures. And instead of doing 7 million things a day, I'm going to start building a team and focus on the areas that I'm really, really good. That's a brilliant answer. So when it comes to thinking annually and thinking more long term, um, what, what are sort of the key things that people should start to focus on? I mean, you mentioned team. As it, would you say like being financially literate and, and being able to read all um, your, your, your sort of scorecards is another important part of it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, but it, it really is it's personal preference, right? So one thing that we have to be really conscious of is how easily influenced we are. So yeah, I follow a lot of people on podcasts and social, and if I'm not careful, I'll like let their personal preferences become mine. So thing mm -hmm. number one is to really understand what it is you want. And I like to think in, in terms of 20 year chunks. Um, so like, where do you want to be 20 years from now? And then you take that and you break it down into five years and then you take those five years and you break it down into annual and you take the annual and you break it down into quarterly and then you take quarterly and break it down into weekly. And here's what's interesting. If, um, if you have a five year plan, right. And you start thinking in terms of weekly activities that you want to do to get to that goal. So again, there's a lot of reverse engineering involved here. And if you make 1% progress, per week towards your five-year goal. If you keep at that space or at that pace, you'll actually double the goal if everything remains constant because there are over 200 something weeks in a five-year period. So 1% gain every week is actually 200 something percent progress, not 100%. So that's really the difference, you know, is number one, you really understand where you want to be like for you, like what really matters for you, the entrepreneur. Is it lifestyle? Is it legacy? Is it giant company? Is it monthly? Like whatever it is, it's okay, as long as it's what you want. And then you think of where you want to be in 20 years. Um, and the reason why you want to do that is because it makes you think a lot bigger. And then you chunk that down and okay, where, where do I want to be in five years with that 20 year goal in mind? And then with that five-year goal in mind, where do I want to be over the next 12 months? And with that 12-month goal in mind, what do I want to do with it this quarter or this, yeah, this quarter, this next 12-week period, you know? And then with that in mind, what do I want to do this week? What are the big things to accomplish? And man, if you, if you follow that framework as silly and, and basic as it sounds, and just stick with the freaking plan, you know, and not deviate. <laughs> Um, you can end up doing way better than you thought because of the math that I just went through, which is pretty cool. You know, it's funny because um, I think you may have uh, touched on this stuff a little bit in one of the Inner Circle letters. And I started thinking about my 20-year plan and I started breaking it down. And part of it was actually to start this podcast and then that led to actually getting you on the podcast. So it's, it's quite funny how things have actually come sort of full circle. <laughs> so... What I wanted to ask you uh, then, to, to kind of close, is what's your 20-year goal? Uh, well, I'll put it in the, in the professional context. I, uh, I want to be David Ogilvy when I grow up. Um, so I'm 46 now, and my hero, you know, like of all of the mentors I've ever had, with the exception of my grandfather, I mean, no one could ever take his place. But in terms of our business, which is the business of advertising and marketing, I, that to me, David Ogilvy is my all-time personal hero for a myriad of reasons. Number one being, he made advertising very respectable. He and Leo Burnett, and um, I'm blanking on the guy's name, or Bill Burnback, you know, like mm -hmm. guys like that, made that whole industry into something that was really, a, a, in my opinion, very noble and respectable. 
industry. And so I would like to be the David Ogilvy of online advertising because everybody hates us right now. And I don't think it's necessary. I think we can do a lot better. And um, it's, just a, it's just changing the way we, we do things and changing some habits and, and practices. And uh, so with that in mind, um, in 20 years, my plan is to have an agency that does the creative work and builds campaigns for successful businesses, not beginners or anything like that. Not that there's anything wrong with them. I'm just not very good in that environment. So that's the plan is to have that and uh, have it be very successful. That's fascinating. That's a very big, uh, ambitious goal. I love it. Awesome. I don't know. I mean, I, you know, I saw this interview with a guy named Rob Deerdeck, who's awesome, by the way. He's a, a TV star and a, an athlete and really, really smart guy. It was on Lewis Howe's School of Greatness uh, YouTube channel. So oh, he yeah. was interviewing uh, Rob. And Rob talks about it doesn't matter how big the, the goal is if you can reverse engineer it to a believable plan, not believable to other people, but a conceivably believable plan in your own mind, then it becomes a doable and a realistic thing. And um, I've always, I've really agreed with that. I've never heard it articulated that way until I saw his interview. But I don't think any goal is, is overly, not that you were saying mine was overly ambitious, but I don't think anything is insurmountable as long as you can break it down to a, a, a believable and achievable plan. Fantastic. It's inspiring stuff. Well, Frank, it's been absolutely fascinating uh, hearing your story and everything else. And uh, yeah, big thank you for uh, joining me on the podcast. Thanks for having me, man. I appreciate it. Would you like to become a Marketing Bytes Insider? It's 100% free. Just go to marketingbytes.com. That's B-I-T-E-S, marketingbytes.com, and enter your name and email to get updates of when new episodes are being released, behind-the-scenes content that nobody else gets to see, and just to say a big thank you for joining my insiders list, I'm going to give you a ton of goodies uh, that nobody else has access to the second you join. So go to marketingbytes.com and enter your name and email in the form.